And then he said, don't wish it was easier, wish you were better. Don't wish for less problems, wish for more skills. I can't catch a break, guys. Yeah. Get them the fuck away from me. I can't I can't be around those guys. People think, oh well, cleaning your room, that's just a cliche. It's like, yeah, really, eh? Just go ahead and try it. If people had any idea how powerful sleep is for healing from anything, and the fact that it's free. My mind is absolutely bulletproof, solid as a rock. Podcast. Hello everybody and welcome back to the Fight and Fit show. This week we're going to be covering the satisfaction factor. So are you being mindful with your food? Are you enjoying it? Are you actually satisfied and nourished mind, body and soul with the nutrition that you're taking in? Or are you mindlessly eating and grazing and find yourself just kind of stuck in a rut? That's what we're going to cover today. I really hope that we can help you guys understand what it means to enjoy your food and help get you out of the rut of just mindlessly munching and grazing and snacking and overeating if that's your thing hopefully this will be a little bit of help so guys i hope everybody's having a lovely week as we said we're going to be talking about the satisfaction factor so are you satisfied with your nutrition chris what tips do you have for people out there to bring more satisfaction into their diet uh so first i would say um eat mindfully slow everything down don't rush it and don't eat um while you're distracted by something um when you suggest to eat mindfully one of the things to do is to slow right down and uh, focus on the different sensations there are, they can be a lot more subtle um than you might want so when you slow things down you can start analyzing all the different things um, every food has a different like texture, a different feel, and a different flavor. And if you just eat it, horse it all in and try and swallow it without even chewing, you won't notice that. And there's a lot of different varieties and cool to explore. I know some some of the big issues with me growing up with nutrition was how I was a picky eater. You know, I was very mm-hmm. sensitive to kind of tastes and textures and trying new stuff, and even just kind of in general trying new stuff. And that comes from having a fixed mindset. And so I kind of just believed, you know, I liked certain things. I like things a certain way. And one of the big things that changed the game for me was, you know, Hale, Gordon Ramsay, you know, just kind of listening to somebody who was really passionate about food and listening to them talk about it and kind of exploring and really explaining why flavors like this work, why this is a great food. Like this man could get excited about a cucumber, you know? And so I was never excited about foods that weren't, you know, the typical foods that most people, you know, like really highly processing chicken nuggets, waffles, things that are just like really simple carbohydrates, <clears throat> maybe, you know, stuff like ketchup, you know, it's quite, quite sharp, quite vinegary and this kind of stuff. And then you kind of get stuck on that same bland, not maybe not bland, but same kind of routine. It's like, you don't really want to widen your palate any more than that. And so, you know, salads and stuff like that for me took a long, long time to introduce. And that's kind of what I did was because, you know, coming from, been a child and a teenager into an adult i kind of understood especially you know as i started to get into fitness and understood how important nutrition was and how important the philosophy of kind of tasting the rainbow and understanding that you know many foods of many colors are going to have many vitamins and minerals in them all of which are very very important and me even stuck on you know the color yellow and red and orange in my diet is like you know it's like it's not really good for me but my palate wasn't used to it and so one thing that i had to do is start being mindful about what i was eating i had to start trying to eat stuff and even though i thought i wasn't going to like it you know i was just going to try it a little bit and so you know much like many different things we can be conditioned to things in a certain way especially with nutrition and so anything that challenged my current palate you know would nearly give me like a retching effect and so yeah <clears throat> i knew i knew I'm but, pretty sure everyone had one food like that in their life. Like yeah. at least one food where they're trying to like, Whoa. And for some people, there literally might be a very, very large barrier. There's some foods like you just might never, ever, no matter how bad you want it, just to just don't agree with you, which is fair enough. But to box yourself in to just say, listen, everything that I eat now, that's what I like. I'm not eating anything else. It's like, it's a very narrow way of thinking. Like, you know, Peter, for example, I remember at one stage, like, when he came in, we had the knock was in the fridge. I remember he's like, he used to always go for the same knock on. I said, Oh, Pete, did you ever try this one? He's like, Oh, no, I tried this one. I was like, Oh, did you try any other ones? He was like, No, uh, this is the first one I tried. I was like, So the first one you tried, you liked, and you're not going to try any more. I was like, How do you know that your favorite one is sitting in that fridge waiting on you? Um, Chloe, uh, my, my fiance, my partner, she uh, would have been, 
you know, quite selective. Now, again, she's actually better eating vegetables and all that kind of stuff than me. But still, like, you know, with trying new stuff, you might be a little bit reserved. And, uh, you know, a couple months ago, she tried garlic aioli. I'm not sure if any of you guys are, you know, uh, what, are, what are they called? Garlic girls? She literally, she garlic literally girls. Re- recommended that to me the, the other day. Yeah, I'm That's sure she did, yeah. And so, again, like, you know, maybe we never would have even tried in the past and then tried it now. It's our new favorite thing. And so, again, it's like this is kind of the issue with this kind of narrow way of thinking is that we really do get stuck in certain patterns with food where only a certain way of doing it is acceptable and there's a broader you know spectrum of flavors that's out there you know it's like maybe you're you're literally just kind of a carbohydrate kind of person you know so maybe you've never tried pork maybe you've never tried this and so another thing for me with that kind of mentality growing up was like cooking method is massively important seasoning is massively important so understand is like just because you don't like it one way doesn't mean you won't like it another way and this is key for sustainability in the diet because if you have to get a certain amount of protein in for your goal and you're struggling to do that right now, we need to make it enjoyable. There's we so need many to people. New foods. Well, we definitely need to introduce new foods, but we also need to work within the foods you're currently comfortable with. But there's some people that are comfortable with chicken breast, comfortable, not satisfied because of how they're cooking it, because of how they're seasoning it. Seasoning it. And so, uh, same with protein shakes. It's like, they're, I'll, I'll force it into me. It's like, it's, you know, a trigger thing for me. It's like, I don't want you forcing it. That's not a good, sustainable approach for this. It's like, what if we put it in a smoothie? How would that work? You know, what if we put it in your oats? How would that chicken work? Breast. You know, Did you, you know, see the guy, uh, no, we're not chicken Tanner, right? Did you, Have you seen your man Tanner on I YouTube? Say, He's coming up on shorts. Yeah, his meat shakes. A meat shake. Meat shakes. I have seen. I've seen a few people now uh, blending blending chicken breast and water and drinking it. Listen, that like probably a bodybuilder, no doubt. You know. Yeah. And well, uh, again, not a bodybuilder, but he's a crossfit athlete sort of guy. He's not a yeah, bodybuilder. So he's more about like the, functional fitness. These stuff. people are hyper committed, and those these mm-hmm. these kind of people are listen. They're willing to put satisfy satisfaction to the side for a wee bit, or maybe even just with the type of head that they have. You know, flavor really just isn't that important to them. They're just I like, think he enjoys that. it. Yeah, there you go. No, it's just fucking loves chicken. I'll get it into me. I know it's good for me. Let's go. Yeah. Listen, and, and, and that's part of it. And so that kind of mentality isn't for everybody, but expanding in that direction is always something that we challenge people to do. Like, again, like cold showers are now something that I do every single time that I get into the shower, where so, whereas before it was it was a dread. It was an absolute fear. And then when I started to do it, it was an abs- like a sensational victory. Um, everybody in the gym, you know, I was doing cold showers and I was doing them near enough. And now again, it's just something that I do because I expanded myself and conditioned myself to be able to do something to know where it's a point. It's like it's actually something that I enjoy. And that's what I would hope people could do with their nutrition. So if there is something that you're struggling with in terms of nutrition, a good strategy would just be again let's make a list of foods you absolutely love let's make another list of foods you're willing to try and let's make another list of foods that are an absolute definitely not at least not yet and so again let's just start trying to grow in a specific direction and then on top of that chris sorry not to just go off in another big rant but you know the satisfy satisfaction factor being we have to enjoy it and we have to change our approach to cooking these meals try new things try new tactics do some research how do we get the most out of it z a c k dot c h u g zach dot chug on youtube tiktok instagram for plenty of amazing tasty recipes i think it's aussie a u s s i e fitness is another one on youtube too i recommend to everybody it's like listen the the new gen of fitness food is out there and I'm sure if you follow a couple of those guys, your your algorithm will pick it up and you'll be inundated with plenty of really, really kind of fake away meals that are high in protein, high in vitamins. And they're all and they're easy to make as well. Yeah. yeah what's really, what's really your man good. as well? Sean Kennedy. Sean Kennedy, he's he's the goat of that kind of stuff, but also like really stupid and simple to make, which is kind of his whole thing. It's like, listen, I know, you know, you've seen some of these fitness foods and you know, there's about three items too much, you know, a bit of, bit of prep or a bit of organization is a bit too much. Like Sean Kennedy, I think it, it, like really anybody can make them. Anybody, any cooking level, any skill level seems pretty reasonable. Something, something that I think is really good is uh, nachos, high protein nachos. So uh, you basically get your Doritos or your nachos, whatever you want, 
go on it, put it in a thing, cook up your mints, pour the mints over it, like with Doritos. salad and all that. Yeah, or nacho, like any sort of nacho. Uh, and then pour your meat over it, and then like your cheese and all that sort of stuff, and it's absolutely delicious. Now, again, it's not the healthiest thing in the world, but it's really, really enjoyable, and you can have like about 45 grams of protein in it. It's insane. But also, like, it depends. What 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 do you have with it? It's like, what if we, like, obviously, again, like, mind it with the with well, calories. You, but... you can cook the, say, the mints or whatever. But, it's, but it, like, on the side of a guacamole, you know, you've got onions, peppers, uh, and avocado. It's like, is that not healthy? You know, you've it, obviously, again, depending on, on the portions, if you're overeating, maybe it's not healthy for you in the long term. But it's like, you know, that's a, that's a side dish that has vitamins and minerals in it. You know, a salsa verde, which is, again, you know, like, onions, um, onions, peppers, parsley cilantro maybe some kind of vinaigrette in it and it's like again so it's like all these kind of stuff is like it doesn't like just because it has naturals in it doesn't now put it into unhealthy category what what the biggest thing that i'm trying to go after in my diet and for a lot of my clients is it's not about what you're eating it's like like are you really going to sit there and say you're never going to eat chips again or you're never going to eat crisps again or you're never going to eat chocolate again? no the issue for an awful lot of people it's like it's not about what are you eating it's about what you're excluding and so again, mm-hmm. it's like you're not taking in vitamin, vitamins and minerals. That's not healthy. It's like just because you're taking in sugar doesn't mean you are now unhealthy. It's all about the big scale of things. It's like a well-nourished body can handle some sugar. A malnourished mm-hmm. body only getting sugar and, and saturated fats as and on polyunsaturated fats, shitty fats, as its only fuel source is not healthy. You know, on on top of not sleeping enough, you know, not drinking enough water, not moving enough. It's like that's what not being healthy looks like. It's like you know, having fucking Doritos with your mints to hit your protein target isn't going to now move you from the healthy to non-healthy category. You know, it, but so on top of that, like I would have never before I even tried that. I would have never eaten nachos ever. Like if someone went to the cinema and they got nachos at the cinema, I would look at them like, who gets nachos? Um, like even Doritos, like Doritos are a thing. Like, oh, I love Doritos. I have never been a, a big fan of um, Doritos for some reason. I'm not a big crisp person, but like these nachos with mints over it. Yeah, no, nah, nah, that's not my thing. But um, with the mints, it's actually unreal because you get to just dip. It's like each Doritos a wee fork or a wee spoon for protein. I understand um, how it works, Chris. I get you. Another thing I would say, just on that, very, very simple. It's like you're talking, you know, something close to. A bolognese dressing, you know, again, like you're talking onions, mints, garlic powder, you know. Make small, it basically the same way. Yeah, nearly the same way. It's like, what about, you know, a chopped up potato, a chips? And it's like, again, it's like, oh, it's chips. Chips are bad for you. It's a potato. Depends how you took it. Are you, are you deep fat frying in oil? Are you using your, 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 your next gen air fryer? You know, are you, are you, you baking in the oven with minimal oil? You know, it's like, and then again, what are your sides? Like, you have vegetables, or is, is it on the side of a, a big fuck off salad as well? It's like, what are we doing here it, when we demonize foods? Is that you're actually removing an awful lot of the satisfaction that could come if you were to, right, okay, yes, don't deep fat fry your chips. I think most people now know it's, yeah, too much polyunsaturated fats and it's not, not good for you. And so, you know, what about a potato? Are we, are we hating on the humble potato? Is the, it's the potato's fault. It's like, no. You know, what about a sweet potato? You know, what about, what about you know, parsnip chips? What about, you know, um, have you ever carrots. had parsnip chips? They're pretty tasty. Actually, I'd say they are, but I've never. Yeah, tried because 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 what are they? They're just a root vegetable, mm-hmm. the same as a potato. You know, it's the same as a sweet potato, the same as a uh, as a carrot. Near enough. Now, again, obviously, again, they're still a little bit different in their structure and their texture and all that kind of stuff. Why did it call? Why did it call? Uh, why did it call chips instead of just like potato sticks? They're chip carrot sticks, huh? They're chips. They're chips. They're French fries, oh, no, that's what they are. Okay, well, uh, I just thought it was a bit weird that we called them chips. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure the, if one of the TikTok channels are all over there, why are certain things called the way they are? Mm-hmm. Why, is so, it, why, is a, why is a boot called a boot, Chris? No idea. That's, that's not stress about it. Let's move on. <laughs> is that epistemology? Um, all right, so... First things first, right? To discover the satisfaction factor, all we mean by that is that we want to basically expand uh, the range of meals and the range of foods that we have that can actually give us some sort of fulfillment or enjoyment. And one of the ways to do that is to experiment with different flavors and textures. And as a general rule, what you want to do is have the tone or the the vibe that 
you can try it and not like it. It's absolutely fine to try something. You're like, oh, I want to try it. And then, oh, I actually don't like that and get something else instead. That's 100% okay. You don't have to like absolutely everything. There's some vegetables. I still, to this day, do not like mushrooms. Mushrooms ruin a meal for me. If I have mushrooms on the side of a plate or even the side of a you know, fry up or something like that there, the mushrooms like ruin it for me. The texture, the taste, the flavor, the smell. It's not It's not for me. The same with the um, tomatoes on their own. I'm, I have uh, an experience when I was younger. A granddad, we used to go to granddad's and he used to make us up some like um, little bits of toast or whatever and he'd get some cherry tomatoes and like fry them up a little bit and put them on. He's like, oh, no, no, try it. And I bit into it and it exploded in my mouth and I was like, Whoa. It was wrong. Traumatized. So yeah. So, so ever since then, I'm just like, ah, tomatoes. I can, I can leave them. But there's loads of other vegetables that I like, and uh, because I have those other vegetables I like, I don't have to like tomatoes. That's fine. So, right. So, do you want to stick with this, or do you want to move on to the next one? Um. Well. Doo -doo -doo. Uh, yeah. Fine. Let's move move to the next one. The next one is feel your fullness. Tune into your body signals of fullness. Practice mindful eating and learn to stop eating when satisfied. Uh, reflect on emotional and environmental factors that influence fullness. So tune into your body signals for fullness. What do you think that means? Yeah, we kind of, we kind of touched on this um, a couple of weeks before, and obviously, yeah, we'll, we'll go over it now um, as well. But like I said, it's like we're back to we're back to the mind mindfulness thing. Like, so mindfulness mm -hmm. is is a brand new craze, craze, and basically, what it means is. When we as human beings get into a habit, we have automated our thoughts and behaviors nearly to the point where we don't have to be present. And this is actually initially a benefit. It's like if you want to tie your shoelaces, it's like it doesn't make sense and it wouldn't be ideal for you to have to think about all the in in intricacies every single time. When you got dressed this morning, did you put your right leg or your, your left foot on? We weren't mindful of it. Now, you can still do all these things mindfully, but for the vast majority of the time now we do them, it habitually and so the same when we eat and we fall into these eating patterns and some eating patterns are very beneficial and others might not be serving you currently one of the things that you could just be doing is you could just be eating whatever's on your plate and not tuning into is this enough food for me is the portion that i've gotten used to on my plate the chinese dishes out to me that my mom dishes out to me that the husband dishes out to me is that enough for me or is that too much? Am I mindful that when I'm starting to eat this meal and when it's coming about halfway through, maybe I'm already full and I become null to the fact that I'm full because I'm not present. It's like when I eat, which we eat all the time, by this stage, it's probably a habit. You know, some people, I remember a guy, John Richardson, a, com a comedian, he often talked about, you know, his little ritual with his food it's like you know he'd save himself the best bits for the end so it's like this guy was in this habit it's like what he'd do is like you know he'd eat all the the small chips first so it was just the perfect square chip at the end with all the the big long uh, fatty potato in the middle that big wholesome chip on your plate he'd leave that to the end he'd eat the ends of the sausage so it's just the fillet of the sausage, he'd eat the end of the bacon, so it's just that little roundy bit of bacon. He cut the edges off his soda farrel eh, or the potato bread, just so it was this nice little circle in the middle, and you know, just this little corner beans, whatever it is. And so he created this little routine for himself, and I'm sure that he would just do that without thinking. And so maybe you've got a similar thing, and maybe your habit is I clean my plate. And that's what mine is. I clean my plate. I don't think too much about it. It's like whatever's on this plate is going to be gone by the end of it. But when we get habitual about a habit becomes not mindful and if you are experiencing a result that you're not happy with it is good to kind of go back you have to then be present in the behavior and listen to what's going on and watch what's going on and watch how you're feeling and watch what you're thinking and really trying to dig deep into the behavior and the experience and go right again as we as, as it pertains to this it's like am i full yet or do you just eat way past fullness or are you the kind of person who stops why why do you think people miss their society signals uh, for me personally it's because the food tastes so damn good i just want to keep going that's a that's a good one any other one this i'm a, a, another one maybe conditioning clean your plate there's mm -hmm. starving children in the world all Where right you get that from that's right that's where i grew up <laughs> yeah children uh, children in africa would love that dinner all right okay if you say so i'll eat it all you know um, again may, and may, maybe it's a thing it's like you know it's like i don't want to waste that you know it's on my plate 
I don't want to waste it. You know, I'll just eat, eat that food up. That's yummy, yummy, yummy dinner. Why don't I want to waste it? You know, um, you know, it, it maybe it could be, you know, from back in the famine times, could be in my genes. You know, I was like, oh, Jess, can't let a bit of food go to waste, a bit of famine mentality. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I think those are two ones. Another one I would say is eating too quickly and eating, being distracted as well. So, like, again, the, the background tone is like, eat until everything's gone. And to do that, Joe, you know, you'll be sitting scrolling on your phone and just eating, and the meal is complete when everyone's finished, not when you're full. And uh, something that we have learned in our precision nutrition uh, course is that you want to eat until you're about 80% full. And that will, like, if you're eating to 80% full, it will cause you to slow down and to try and catch that point where you're like satisfied, but you're not stuffed. And something else that, like, one of the benefits of this, the really, really good benefits that I've noticed, especially let's say on my lunch break, um, is if I eat to about 80% full, I have lots of energy. I'm not stuffed. I don't feel lethargic after. I don't have that, like, bloat and all that sort of stuff after. Um, but if I eat to 100% full, I usually end up overeating to the point where after I meal, I just want to lay down. I just want to sit. And if you're in this industry, you have to be up walking about and all that jazz. It's not very, uh, it's not very good. It's not very conducive. Here's another thing about it is portion size are key for this. It's like if you – like maybe you're just – like again, may, because let's say you're in the habit of cleaning your plate, which – yeah. Like again, is is what like I get a bit of a, a bit of a dopamine hit when I clean my plate as well. Like I like, like clean dopamine plate. Hit. Yeah, the clean plate club. It's satisfying. I like I like when my plate's clean. I like it. There's just something about it. It's satisfying. It's squared away. It's tidy. Bop, bop, bop. Mop it all up and it's done. And so, one of the only issues with that is portion size. Because like, mm-hmm. it's fine to clean your plate if your portions are the correct size. Great, clean your plate by all means. Lick lick the, lick the plate clean. But if your portion size is too much and now you're force feeding yourself to the plates clean anyway because that's just your habit, it's like, well, that's going to be an issue. And so we can kind of bypass the problem by if you already understand what an appropriate portion for yourself is. And if you don't yet understand what an appropriate portion for yourself is, again, using your hunger cues and your fullness cues to give. It's like, hey, listen, I'm starving all the time. I'm obviously not eating enough. Or I'm, you know, in a severe calorie deficit. It's like, or again, I'm overeating because every meal after I'm feeling bloated, absolutely in a heap. I can't do anything after each meal. So, yeah. Uh, so you're saying slow down, and uh, if you slow down, you'll be a lot more satisfied from your meals. And also you watch your portions crazy. again. If it's on your plate, if it's on your plate, it doesn't mean you should eat it. But if that happens, you know, a couple of times and you're making the meals, it's like, you know, calm down. What are you doing? It's like, we have this, the, the mammy portion in Irish culture. You know, it's like, listen, the mammy portion. Six, six roasties, two heaped potato mashers, you know, two chicken fillets, vegetables falling off the side, gravy on top, more gravy, please. You know, it's like, which is reasonable. You know, it's reasonable. It tastes amazing. Fair enough. Have at it. But if you're struggling with weight loss, you know, obviously it's going to be a problem. I agree. So uh, the last one on this is reflect on emotional and environmental factors that influence fullness. Uh, what emotional factors do you think influence fullness? That's interesting. Stress. Stress, yeah. Boom. That was the like, first one came to my head. You know, st- stress. For me, I don't eat when I'm stressed. I, don't, I can't don't. eat when I'm I, I cannot eat when I'm stressed. No, actually, that's not true. I can't eat proper meals when I'm stressed. I can snack mm. when I'm stressed. I can snack yeah. like crazy when I'm stressed. I snack more when I'm stressed, yeah. but I couldn't sit down to enjoy a meal like if I'm actually like, like, actively emotionally stressed. Like if I if, if I've got work stress, to be fair, like I'm pretty good at just putting it all down and continuing my day. But it's like if mm. I've got personal life emotional stress, like there's something really, you know, bugging you. With bugging me, yeah, exactly. That's Demanding it. Like, your attention. Yeah, I'm. I'm just. I'm just not going to sit down to to a proper meal. I'm going to, again, probably eat the same amount of calories over about five or seven different snacks. And yeah, again, so stress is a big one. You know, anger. <laughs> are too angry, which is reasonable. You know, it's like, are you somebody who's angry? Angry. Fucking child of mine. I'm trying to imagine that angry. Uh, angry. What about S- sad? sad? I think sadness yeah. is one. Like yeah, uh, self soothing. Some uh, good, what is it, soul food, which all makes you feel, feel better. So, like, like a nice, warm, hot meal, or um, 
I was just thinking maybe of somebody sitting up in the room with a spoon eating a big tub of ice cream crying. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I wonder, I, wonder post, that, break up. I wonder if that's actually real or if that was like a marketing thing by uh, some, like by Big Ice Cream. Big Ice Cream? Yeah, listen, uh, Ultimate Comfort Food, it's a good point. Yeah, just slip that in the movie there. Take that in the wrong comp there. There's a conspiracy, that's it. Um, so, what were, the, what were the other ones? And then environmental factors. What environmental factors do you think influence fullness? Well, again, like if, if, if you're at a party, you know, mm-hmm. if you're at a party and everybody's snacking, oh, no, they're bringing out the pizza. Oh, no, they're bringing out the chips. You know, they're bringing it to the, oh, here comes the cake. It's like, it's, it nearly seems, it'd be rude not to. Mm-hmm. It'd be rude not to. Should we have another one, will we? Should we? We were at Dad's for, for my birthday there last week. And how many times did you offer you a second slice of cake? Twice. I took everyone. Yeah. And this is yeah. it. And so, and um, you know, on top of it, coffee. Oh, do you want to roll yeah, it's sociable. It's just kind of sociable. It's a sociable thing to do. Yeah. Um, what about uh, distraction, being distracted while you do it? That's what I think would be would be one. So at the movies, uh, an environmental factor will lead you to overeat. Enjoy your eating. Just literally just grazing at cinema. It heightens the experience. <laughs> this is even <laughs> this is even better. <laughs> Um, yeah, hundred percent. And but but again, like I know one of this. I'm listening to the book, uh, the Realm of Hungry Ghosts. I was telling this before the podcast, mm-hmm. and it it just reminded me just about the dopamine. Like we're just absolute dopamine fiends. Like what? Like what is happening in that cinema at that time? You're getting dopamine because you're getting this novel, amazing, exciting roller coaster of emotions. Possibly, you know, maybe it's all funny. Maybe it's just laugh, 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 lighten up your brain. You know, maybe it's sad. Maybe it's exciting. Oh, maybe it's drama. Whatever it is. And so, and then on. That's not enough. Oh no, popcorn. Oh, salty. Just lighten up your brain. Salt. Oh, sugar. <laughs> Nachos. Crunch, crunch, crunch. Like just engulfed in dopamine. And that is a very popular experience. You know. Um, you know, again, it's something very similar when you're out with your friends and you're having a few drinks. Again, alcohol, just like letting those dopamine uh, centers, you know, just kick in because obviously the alcohol makes you feel a certain way. The inhibitions are loose. You're more socializing. You're eating with friends. The food's there. The drink tastes good. It's like, so again, it's like, it's just this whole dopamine experience. Like what's happening when you're sad? It's like, you know, you're sad. You're there eating the ice cream. You know, it's like, again, you're getting a release from crying that's why you're crying you're crying to soothe yourself to make yourself work through the process so you can feel better while you're doing that is that enough no it's not i need ice cream too that i require a high level of neurochemicals to bring myself back to base and what can happen is if you're a person who you know grew up in a stressful guys i really 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 recommend this and that book i just think it's so interesting gabber mate the realm of hungry ghosts it's all about addicts and addiction just in general to drugs to food to gambling to you know the your man Garamante talks about his addiction to just like you know he's nearly like a collector he just collects stuff uh, like uh, music records or uh, musical tapes Class, classical sees, music classical music and it's not about the it's not about the actually listen to me barely listens to them at all and obviously, again, a lot of people listening to this will think like, sure, how is that a problem or how is that an addiction? It's like, you know, to the point where he's, you know, he's all oh, making justifications, lying to people, you know, not really being upfront and honest, you know, taking time from things that he would call priorities to, to pursue this thing because he's in this thing of like, oh, there's the one that I don't have. And so, again, it's just kind of lighting up his brain and people who grew up in stressful situations or whose parents were stressed during or, 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 or man was stressed during a, what would you say, development when they're, when they're in the womb, you know, post labor, you know, it's like if the man was stressed, couldn't be attentive enough, you know, if there was actual fighting and combating and stress and hunger and whatever it is, like that has an effect on your ability to tolerate or your, your, your sensitivity to dopamine. And so if that's the kind of situation you grew up in, you need a higher dose of dopamine to feel level or something like that, you know, it's like to feel normal. And so, if that's the kind of situation you grew up to or grew up in, some kind of higher level of dopamine will be just naturally sought out by him. Maybe it'll be drugs. Maybe it'll be bungee jumping. You know, maybe it'll be collecting stuff. Maybe it'll be emotionally eating. Maybe it'll, who knows what it'll be, but 
again that higher need for that higher level whereas most people would just or not most people you know the the normal slash healthy brain you know wouldn't necessarily need any external thing to come back to the point of where they would feel equal like an equilibrium they'll feel like that homeostasis so again we're constantly trying to get to that that base level and if something knocks you off and puts you in a bad mood you're not at that neutral level and so people have these soothers these mechanisms these habits these vices to bring them to that level and for obviously as it pertains to this you know it can be food and so you have to deal with food all the time and you know maybe it's genetic maybe it's you know how you were you know is it nature is it nurture it's like in, a lot of it is nature i think he referenced something like 70 percent of it is in some cases nature and 30 percent of it is nurture or maybe just said let's say um, that it is what is epigenetics so epigenetics is essentially with certain genes through an env- environmental situation so if something happens in the environment it will cause certain genes to turn on and without that thing happening or that environmental situation the gene would be dormant and even though you have it, it would absolutely not um, so, come into consideration so if so you instead of tendency, being gen- just sorry to interrupt but instead of being a genetic or environmental it's actually both exactly this is it and so it's like time. you know you you can have the gene and it just might never activate because you're never in that situation or you know it's like yeah pretty much that's it yeah yeah that's and a, so again if that situation is present you're going to be, then be you know, sent down this rabbit hole and it will feel and society might tell you that the choice and it could be a choice. And for a lot of people, it is a choice and it will equally and just as correctly also be a habitual behavior that you feel like you've got absolutely no control on. And that's kind of why the mindfulness thing is such a popular kind of recommendation for it. It's like, well, you kind of have to come into that space where you are making a decision And then we talk about environment and say, okay, well, you know, when you're feeling mindful, you may absolutely need to completely redesign, reshape your environment and your surroundings because that might be the thing that's setting you down this route of you don't have a choice. Because as soon as we talk about habits, which is cue, routine, reward, if your environment's telling you to do this, like, again, if you're sad, can we get you out of an environment that's chronically making you sad? Yes, we can. If, you know, if, if it's a job, if it's a person, you know, if it's how you deal with stress, but also maybe you can't. Okay, well, what's the next thing? It's like it's your routine. And so if you're in this environment where you're constantly sent down this road, it's like maybe we have to leave the job or we have to change the environment because you don't have the power. Or maybe you again, you could just will your way through it. and people do that. And there's people who try that and they fail again and again and again and again. So it really is this kind of, you know, you could change your entire life and you could take absolute control or you could feel like you're absolutely powerless and you've got zero control over it and it's kind of down to the individual. Yeah, well, uh, it, I wouldn't say zero control over it. Like lots of people have lots of uh, control over their lives and people feel like they don't have the sense of hopelessness because they've tried repeatedly and failed. But you know, there could just be one attempt away from solving the, the whole issue. And I think it's really important there to understand the environmental factor being a very very a uh, big influence on it like if you are in a room that's just gray all day every day you know, like you're going to feel pretty gray which is a uh, if you're in it and it's like bright pink you're going to feel pretty pink like just like there's the there, there is a whole thing with color theory and your environment and different things that influence how you feel and how you act and um, when you're not mindful and you're not aware of what's going on, you will be unaware of how these factors influence you. And if you are sitting in a shop, there's a reason why not sitting in a shop, like going to shop. There's a reason why all the sweets and all the little like things are like a euro or two euro, just real quick that you could buy, or sitting right up at the front of the desk or the front of the the counter at the last moment. It's like oh, I'll just get that real quick. It's because like they're trying to hijack basically the biology of all these different things that will influence your decisions to buy something that is not even to just buy something um, and it might solve a certain problem for you in that moment which is Joe oh, I'm just feeling a little bit peckish which uh, is very manipulative but the environmental factor is the environmental factor is understated I think in the health and fitness industry and one of the first things we look at as uh, coaches would or not one of the first things but one of the things that we would recommend is that like you know, is your environment set up to make this easier 
uh, to achieve the goal. So like it is let's say with protein shakes is your protein in the back of the cupboard or is it in like on your counter with your blender ready to rock like if you have to if it's not there there's no cue to take it well then it's almost like you're invested in forgetting about it and uh, if you can manipulate your environment for success it will help a lot yeah or again if like if, if you have a group of friends and all you've ever done with those friends is go out on the piss the weekend and you're still hanging out with those friends on the weekend it's like Good luck trying to stay sober. It's not not doable, but you're making an absolute mountain to climb rather than saying, "Listen, guys, I can't come out for ten weeks." You know, like you yeah. won't see me. This this goal is far too important for me right now. <laughs> and then it's like, well, now, and now you're in a completely different area, completely different routine, complete like a brand, like the world is your oyster at that stage. You can set up new cues, routines, rewards, all that kind of stuff. But it's like it takes work. And yeah, removing yourself from the environment, Chris. Great, great, great point. Or again, There's... just understanding how influential it is. Something to drive this point point home is that in Vietnam, I'm not sure if anyone, if we've talked about this before, but in Vietnam, uh, lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of soldiers were doing heroin to cope with, let's say, the stress and the demands of the war and all this crazy stuff. And I think like less than 10% became addicted because when they got back to, to their normal lives, heroin wasn't a part of that life. So they don't have to deal with it anymore. They talk about that in, in the book as well, um, in The Realm of Hungry Ghosts. And another big thing that he said about that is like, but also an awful lot of people needed, maybe needed it or used it to soothe how stressful of a situation that was, which was mm. abnormal. And when they came back to a normal life, they didn't need it. And, but the people who actually did stick with their addiction were, were these people who, again, need in general an external source to get to that base level so that that predisposition was there and so it kind of went into like the whole thing of like you know you know food sugar by nature isn't going to cause everybody who takes it to be an addict you have to have that predisposition to it there and that well, comes from you know if you, if, you, pre- if you think about it this way if you have someone who feels sad and then all of a sudden they eat so, something really sweet and then they feel good for a second so like they get a big dopamine hit and that's a positive reinforcement mechanism. So like what's going to happen next time they feel bad? Well, I remember that when I had sugar, I felt good. So they go use that for a wee self-soothing session. Yeah, exactly. But, the, but the, the, the key is, is that apparently most people who didn't have early trauma or didn't have high levels of cortisol, either in utero or through very early years development when you know unique to human beings you know we are literally like our brain size is growing at, a, at like an alarming rate in comparison to you know most other mammals and so in that time is like that really affects how you can bring yourself and cope and so if you can't cope if you are stunted during your coping years or your the developmental of the prefrontal cortex well then you're not going to be as effective at coping and so you will look for uh, something to soothe. And so you shouldn't need to self-soothe growing up. You should have people to do that for you. And if you get into, uh, you know, if you, you, get, you are developing and learning to self-soothe constantly, well, then when you grow up, it's like you could reach for external stimulus to soothe yourself. And obviously that's not always the case in most people or in, in every person that that's the case just as every person who tries an external soother doesn't get addicted. Not all, mm-hmm. um, not all people are, who are, have the predisposition will um, get addicted. And so again, it, it's very, very interesting as well. It's because again, you have to understand who you are, um, both strengths and weaknesses in order to you know, coach yourself effectively. Well, I think another big point in that should be um, a lot of people uh, are addicted to different substances and different things and different, let's say, foods and behaviors due to a lack of social um, love and connection. And you know, when they don't have that, you know, they you say it's a it is an actual like biological need as a soul, yeah, as a yeah. person. Yeah, a need, not a want. Like a need, you need love and connection. Um, and if you don't have that, well, then you start looking for it in loads of different places. Like fucking pornography is a massive uh, epidemic at the moment. Loads of people are basically just like addicted to that um you know there's alcohol there's like everyone's soothing pain and that pain is usually supposed to be soothed by 
Joe, your your close family members giving you a big hug, telling you, you know, like we still got your back, we're still here for you, we're gonna help you. And without that, you know, if you don't get a lot of people don't have that especially in today's society, like we're more lonely than we've ever been in the history of the world, even though we're more connected than ever. It's actually it's such a contradiction. Um the main reason why people are addicted to stuff is usually due to a lack of love and connection. And that love and connection is what usually fixes it. And if you are if you take someone who is an addict and you put them in an environment where they do have actual genuine love and connection, and um, a lot of that can go away. I'll tell you what, Chris, that will lead us right on to next week's topic, which is going to be cope with your emotions without food. And so again, or maybe without your vice. And so obviously we're kind of delving into the realm of addiction and coping. And this is a very, very difficult subject because a lot of people with the right tools and in the right situation still relapse. And so, you know, your success is really dependent on you as the individual. And obviously we're going to give you guys or we're going to talk through and explain some of the ways that you can overcome your need to cope using food and start coping, maybe using, you know, more sophisticated, non-vice related uh, methods. And so we'll we'll delve into that next week. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, sounds like a plan. Cool. Let's guys. do it. That's been another podcast. We hope you guys enjoyed it. We really, really appreciate it. If you have any kind of subject matter you'd like to see in a podcast, if you comment on the YouTube video, or again, send us a little message if you're if you're a member and you're listening, you have our, our details, you can send us a message. We'd love to cover it. If you have anything to add to that, guys, again, comment below. Please like and subscribe to all our channels. We really appreciate it. And yeah, thanks for listening. Have a good one. Peace.